Hello and welcome to this lecture on hyperprolactinemia. In this lecture, we'll be going over the various causes of increased prolactin and we'll give a specific focus on prolactinomas. Before we go into any details about specific conditions, let's quickly give a review to the physiology of prolactin. Prolactin is produced by the lactotroph cells of the anterior pituitary. These cells are regulated by dopamine and thyroid releasing hormone, which is produced by the hypothalamus. Dopamine functions as an inhibitory neurotransmitter to suppress the production of prolactin, whereas thyroid releasing hormone acts as a promoter and causes increased prolactin production. If you have very high levels of estrogen, this could also serve to promote the production of prolactin. The main function of prolactin is to stimulate breast tissue to produce milk. If you have very high levels of prolactin, prolactin can actually inhibit the hypothalamus, causing decreased GnRH leading to decreased FSH and LH, creating a pseudo-menopause state of amenorrhea and anovulation. Finally, it's important to note that after prolactin has done whatever it's supposed to do, it's cleared by the kidneys. Now let's define what hyperprolactinemia actually is. This is a very simple definition. Hyperprolactinemia is any elevation of prolactin. Typically, in most labs, this is defined by a level greater than 20 nanograms per milliliter. The causes of hyperprolactinemia could be divided into two categories. They could either be due to an appropriate physiologic response or due to a more nefarious pathologic cause. The physiologic causes of hyperprolactinemia include pregnancy, nipple stimulation, and stress. During pregnancy, you get increased levels of estrogen and this causes a hyperplasia of the lactotroph cells. This in return causes increased levels of prolactin. And that's why after delivery, mothers produce milk and enter a state of amenorrhea where they have a reduced likelihood of becoming pregnant again. Nipple stimulation of a new mother also triggers the brain to produce more prolactin. As more time passes from delivery, this reflex decreases. A patient who was not recently pregnant will have no response to nipple stimulation. So if you do a breast exam on a patient, then you do lab work and see they have elevated prolactin, the cause is not due to nipple stimulation and do not get tricked by choosing that answer. The last physiologic cause of increased prolactin is stress. This could either be psychological or physical stress and this only causes a mild increase in prolactin. Usually this is only less than 40 nanograms per milliliter. In fact, stress is the most common cause of a mild increase in prolactin. Now let's talk about what you're more likely to be tested on which is a pathologic causes of hyperprolactinemia. When doing an HMP, it's very important to ask what drugs the patient's using. In particular, psych drugs such as antipsychotics, especially risperidone, and TCAs. Other drugs to look out for include antiemetics such as metoclopramide, opioids, OCPs, and the antihypertensive drug, methyl dopa. Most of these drugs cause increased prolactin production by inhibiting dopamine. Once you inhibit dopamine, you get loss of inhibition of the lactotroph cells, which causes an increased production of prolactin. One exception to this rule are OCPs. OCPs can cause increased levels of estrogen, which can cause hyperplasia of the lactotroph cells, causing increased prolactin production. Another category of pathologic causes include hypothalamic pituitary conditions, in particular, the prolactinoma. A prolactinoma will cause an increase in lactotroph cells, causing increased prolactin. Most of the other hypothalamic pituitary conditions cause increased prolactin by inhibiting dopamine. These conditions include other adenomas, craniopharyngiomas, infiltrative diseases such as sarcoidosis, damage due to surgery or trauma, or cancer from other parts of the body. Another potential cause is hypothyroidism. If the body senses that it has low levels of T4, it will respond by increasing levels of TRH. Remember, TRH here will stimulate lactotroph cells to produce prolactin. If you can fix the hypothyroid state by giving the patient levothyroxine, TRH levels will return to normal and prolactin levels will decrease as well. Since prolactin is cleared by the kidneys, a patient with renal failure will also get increased levels of prolactin. A final mechanism to look out for is chest wall trauma. Trauma from surgery, burns, breast implants, and even herpes zoster. It's thought that this trauma stimulates the same neuromechanisms that causes prolactin increase to nipple stimulation in recently pregnant mothers. Now let's focus on prolactinomas in more detail. 
By definition, any type of adenoma could be divided into two categories, either micro or macro. And this distinction is based off of size. If it's less than one centimeter, that's considered a microprolactinoma, and if it's greater than one centimeter, that's considered a macroprolactinoma. Fortunately, most microprolactinomas are benign, and actually 95% of them do not enlarge. Prolactinomas actually are the most common kind of adenomas in females, and make up to 75% of the pituitary adenomas. If you get lab work on a patient and you notice they have elevated levels of prolactin, about 50% of the time, if the patient's female, this is due to a prolactinoma. If the levels of prolactin are actually greater than 200, it's almost guaranteed that the source of this elevation is due to a prolactinoma. The clinical presentation of a patient with a prolactinoma makes a lot of sense if you think about the physiology. The increased prolactin inhibits GnRH, causing decreased LH and FSH, causing decreased estrogen. Because of this, the patient gets put in a pseudomenopause state. They start to lose their menses, get signs of hypogonadism, and have reduced bone density, leading to either osteopenia or osteoporosis. And of course, since you're making so much prolactin, you're going to start to get galactorrhea. As with any tumor in the head, once the mass becomes big enough, you start to get mass effect, and the patient may experience headaches, nausea, and vomiting. Because of its location over the optic chiasm, if the mass gets big enough, you can start to get visual symptoms. In particular, the patient will complain of bitemporal heminopsia. This should be a buzzword for prolactinomas, or actually any other kind of adenoma. The patient's visual field will appear like so. They'll be unable to see anything on the lateral sides of their visual fields. When working up a patient with hyperprolactinemia, you should always do a very thorough HNP. Find out if there's any non-pathologic causes such as pregnancy. Also make sure to know what drugs are taking. Look for symptoms of other causes including hypothyroidism and renal disease. If they have a really big adenoma, you might see visual changes or signs of mass effect like headaches, nausea, and vomiting. In terms of lab work, you obviously want to measure prolactin. If you measure prolactin and you see only a mild elevation, somewhere between 21 to 40, you should repeat the test. Remember, the most common cause of a mild elevation in prolactin is stress. Since you want to rule out hypothyroidism, you should also get a thyroid panel. The most important test you should do is get an MRI of any patient that has elevated prolactin. The reason we get an MRI is to either rule in or rule out prolactinomas. The only time you would not get an MRI is if you know your patient's taking a drug that's known to cause elevated levels of prolactin. The initial treatment for a patient with hyperprolactinemia is a dopamine agonist. You're going to be using a dopamine agonist no matter what the cause is. If it's an adenoma, if it's not an adenoma, if it's macro or micro, you always start off with a dopamine agonist. And typically you use carbergoline. You might also see bromocryptine as a possible answer choice. These drugs have the dual benefit of both decreasing prolactin levels, and if you have an adenoma, the adenoma will actually reduce in size. The main side effects of these drugs include nausea, vomiting, orthostatic hypotension, and mental fogginess. There are two reasons why cabergoline is used more often than bromocryptine. The first reason is it's more effective at decreasing prolactin levels and reducing the size of the adenoma. The second reason is it has fewer side effects and they are less severe. Both of these drugs are not known to be teratogens. However, since bromocryptine is an older drug, it's been studied more frequently in pregnant patients. Therefore, in the instance of a pregnant patient with hyperprolactinemia, you may want to use bromocryptine over cabergoline. If medical management fails, the next line of treatment is transphenoidal surgery. This should only be used if bromocryptine or cabergoline fails to decrease prolactin, symptoms don't improve, and the adenoma size does not decrease after months of therapy. The main drawback with surgery is oftentimes not all the tissue is able to be excised during the surgery, and when this happens, the adenoma may regrow. The last line of treatment is post-operative radiation. This is only used for very large macroadenomas in which all the tissue was not able to be removed during surgery. Alright, that's it for this lecture on hyperprolactinemia. Thank you for listening.